The Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. When looking at this part of the book of Exodus that we read this morning, we can be amazed at the behavior of the Israelites. If there ever was a group of people who should know from firsthand experience that when God promises to do something, God will do it. Those people who should know that should be the Israelites. Think about this, just one month earlier, they had found themselves in a predicament, we might say. After all the plagues that afflicted the Egyptians, after the final plague of death, they were finally released from Egypt and were beginning their trek to the promised land. It should have been clear to them, even then, that their freedom was not a result of their own work or effort, but that it was all the work of God. But now Pharaoh has changed his mind and he has sent his forces out to intercept the Israelites and it seems like they're trapped. They are outnumbered by the Egyptian army. And on the other side is the Red Sea. There's no way for them to cross it. Remember, God promised to deliver them to that promised land. They had his word on it. And it was his acts that allowed them to get this far. Yet what do they do when it appears that it's going to take an act of God to save them? They approach Moses and say, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. They don't trust that God follows through. So what happens? God, through his servant Moses, parts the Red Sea, and the Israelites are able to pass on dry land. They see the water of the sea surrounding them, but they're dry. It's clear to them that this is not Moses doing, and it certainly isn't their doing. It's all God's doing. And once they make it across, God causes a confusion in the pursuing Egyptian ranks, 
and they are swallowed up by the sea, and every last one of them drowned. The lesson the Israelites saw was this. God would provide a way for them to make it where he promised to deliver them. Even though, when they first arrived at the Red Sea, they couldn't see a way out, God provides one for them. Now, just one month away from all of that, there's an obstacle, another obstacle. The people are getting hungry. There's no, there's no fast food restaurant, there's no uh, convenience store along the way to buy food, and there's no source of food, period. Now remember, it wasn't that long ago that they saw God's action to deliver them out of Egypt and allow them to pass through the Red Sea. One would think that having seen that, they could simply trust that even though it doesn't look like there's a way out and that there's any way for them to eat, that God will somehow provide food for them. Yet what do they do? They approach Moses and Aaron and say, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. There's a lot to that statement here. First of all, they're longing for the meat pots they remember in their former life in Egypt. But what they've forgotten is this. They were slaves, and slaves very rarely, if ever, were given meat. If they were so fortunate to have ever eaten any meat at all, it would have been on their very best day, not, not an everyday occurrence. And even then, it was still while they were in shackles and chains of slavery, the slavery they cried out to God to be freed from. At this point in the story today, they're willing to trade their freedom for the shackles and chains of slavery over a piece of meat. The sin of the Israelites is not their hunger. The sin here is this. They refuse to trust in God for all things. They are allowing their current situation to be their God, if you will. They are allowing themselves and their concerns and worries be their God. At this point, it's easy for us, especially knowing the end of the story, to sit back and simply say, what is wrong with those people? How could you have gone through what you've gone through, the crossing of the Red Sea, and still have any doubt at all that God will provide for all your needs? After all, that is what we, on this side of the resurrection, this is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? In explaining this petition of the prayer, Martin Luther puts it this way in the small catechism. Quote, give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. He continues, what is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like." End quote. So with that in mind, before we get too hard on the Israelites for their grumbling, we have to admit there's a lot of them in us, isn't there? The fact is, 
we grumble. We all grumble. We complain. We all complain. We worry. We all worry. And we doubt. We all doubt. We've seen firsthand accounts of the Bible, how God provides for the needs of his people time and time again. We pray all the time, give us this day our daily bread. But then, we complain that what we have is not good enough. Sure, I have food on the table, but it's not what my neighbor is eating all the time. I don't have as nice a house or a car as that person has. I've lost my job. I don't know how we are going to put a pay for a roof over our heads or clothes on our backs or put food on the table for the next month, let alone pay for all the other stuff we're accustomed to. So, if we take a look at ourselves, we find that all too often we are just like those Israelites in the desert and those Jews in the Gospel lesson who followed Jesus around expecting him to provide for our wants as long as we do the right thing. And really, it would make perfect sense if God were to have said to those Israelites in the text, how dare you doubt me? How in the world can you doubt that I will provide food for you after what I did at the Red Sea? Since you don't believe in me well enough, then forget it. You can just starve to death out there in the desert, and I'll find someone else who can do a better job than you. No. What does God do? God provides bread in the form of manna in the morning. There's no reason for it to be there. And all the Israelites have to do is go out, gather it off the ground. It's right there. And then, in the evening, quail appear in the camp. There's no reason for it to show up, but it's there. It's going to be clear that this is all God's doing. It wasn't Moses' work. It wasn't their work of being good enough or having enough faith to make it happen. God provides the manna and the quail simply because that's who God is. God delivers on God's promises. God is sustaining their lives out there in the desert because he's going to be faithful even when we are faithless. And that is the way it is with us yet today. We certainly don't deserve any of the things God provides for us in this life, especially the forgiveness and eternal life that is ours because of what Jesus Christ has done for us at the cross. And yet, St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. The verse doesn't say when we were good enough or when we had stopped complaining or when we had been sincere enough. The simple fact is this. God provides for our needs for this life, our daily bread, each day. Remember when last week I asked people to think about something that is new and good in their lives? There is something new and good in our lives every day. And that is one way, whatever it is we, we think of, that God provides for our needs for this life. And sometimes, in fact many times, it's in ways we don't expect. 
I'm sure you can all think about surprises that you've had in your life. As some people say, God moments. When did you see God in your life? Today or yesterday or the day before? God provides for us every day in ways we don't expect sometimes. But more importantly, God provides our bread for eternal life, and that bread is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ feeds us through his word that points to him as our savior from sin, death, and the power of the devil. It is through him that we see that salvation is not a matter of what we do for God, because we'll never be good enough. We see that because of what Christ does through us, for us, through his life, death, and resurrection, we do have food that lasts forever. We have the means to live eternally because he provides it for us, just as God provided that food in the desert for the Israelites. Unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of people get this wrong. They are like the people in the gospel text who look to Jesus as the source of free food. They are only concerned with comfort in this life. So they teach that if you do good enough good stuff, then God will give you what you want. God will make you healthy and wealthy. And if you aren't, well, you must not believe hard enough or be praying hard enough or doing what it is you have to do in order for God to bless you. Those kind of things are what we may call prosperity theology. Sounds good to people like the grumbling Israelites in the desert and the grumbling Jews in the gospel lesson. Give me stuff for right now. Give me something to eat right now. Give me what I want when I want it or I won't believe you in you anymore. It's a faith that looks at right here, right now. And looks beyond what the miracles actually point to. Sounds comfortable. But that's a faith that seeks, seeks comfort for this life only and is based on a standard that none of us can ever meet. So it is a good thing that out there in the wilderness, God shows his mercy and love for his people by providing for their needs of food. And it's a good thing for us that God doesn't provide for our needs based out of our sincerity or good behavior. But more importantly is this. God doesn't just provide for our needs in this life. He provides what we need for eternal life. And that is forgiveness of sins, which is dependent only on the work of his son, Jesus Christ. For just as God provides bread for his people of old in the wilderness, he provides bread for eternal life in his son. And that's what's even more amazing. God doesn't just provide this once. He continues to shower the bread of life on us richly and daily through the preaching of his word and in the administration of the sacraments, the Holy Spirit works through these means to feed our hungry souls that bread of life, to hear the good news that we are, all of us, forgiven, that we are set free, that there's a better day coming that this time in the wilderness of a sinful, fallen world will come to an end, and he will deliver us in his time to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where we will never be hungry or thirsty or in want again, a land that is ours, all because of what the bread of life has done for us in the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
Thanks be to God that we have been fed with the bread that it endures to eternal life this day. And may he continue to feed us with that bread until we reached that, reached that promised destination in Christ. Amen.
the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Trusting in our loving and almighty God, who abundantly provides the bread of life for all who hunger, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy God, you give gifts and talents to every member of the church. Strengthen all your children and bring them to a full understanding and a of heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, our complex and wonderful world is a sure sign of your abundance and care. Provide for every creature and rain down the bread of heaven that gives life to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Peaceful God, draw the nations of the world to harmony and mutual understanding. Find all of humanity in the unity of love and peace that comes through the Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for those who are hungry, homeless, and who have lost family or friends. Lead them to places of safety, food, and rest. We pray especially for George, Jerry, Warren, Kitty, Bobby, Merle, Evelyn, Ethel, Joan, Dorothy, Jerry's family, Anne's family, and Janice's family. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, you have brought all, us all together in this time and place. Bless this congregation and those who are absent. Draw us into closer community with each other and our community. Lord, in your mercy. Infinite God, we praise you for the lives of those who have died in Christ. Keep our hearts in hope. We have all received the food that endures. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and loving God, we look to you and trust, knowing that you will do far more than we can ask or imagine. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of God. Peace be with you. Ha, ha, ha.